Namaskar. On behalf of Narangiya Ansarik Mahavidyalaya and Department of Geography, I welcome our speakers and participants to the international webinar organized by Department of Geography in collaboration with IQAC of Narangiya Ansarik Mahavidyalaya. Myself, Mr. Polita, Assistant Professor of Geography Department and Technical Coordinator of this webinar, feel extremely happy to inform you that two eminent geographers, Professor Sudhir Thakur, a professor in the Department of Finance, Insurance and Real Estate at the College of Business Administration, California State University, and Dr. Monika Khannan, ma'am, Associate Professor and Head of the Department of Geography, Sophia Girls College, Azmi, Rajasthan, are present with us to share their knowledge and experiences on the topic measuring economic development accounting for natural way. The topic is very relevant in the present as present world as economy is badly affected due to impact of COVID-19. Hope this discussion will be a fruitful one and it will be beneficial for all of us. Before the webinar starts, I would like to request our esteemed participants to consider the following. Kindly keep your device on mute mode during presentation. Don't press presentation button because it will affect both audio and video of all participants. Cooperation from your side is highly solicited. Thank you. Now I request Rita Sarma, ma'am, coordinator IQAC and head of the Department of Education to start the session. Over to Rita Sarma, ma'am. Thank you, Hobi, sir. Namaskar and a very good morning and good evening to you all, according to your time zone. Myself, Rita Sarma, on behalf of IQAC, Narengi and Sulik Mohabitala, I welcome you all to this international webinar organized by the Department of Geography in collaboration with IQAC of this college. Today we have with us two eminent person ladies, Professor Sudhir Thakosar from California, US, and Dr. Monika Khandan Mem from Ajmer, Rajasthan. As our, as our principal, Rita Dr. Hajari Kamam, inaugurates the webinar, our esteemed guest will be introduced before us by Dr. Anjan Talukdar and Dr. Lokhini Gogoi, respectively. Hope the sessions are going to be fruitful and interactive. After their deliberations, a question answer session will follow, where our queries will be answered by our guest at mass, as much as possible, keeping in mind the time constraints. So, without wasting time, may I now request our principal, Rita Dr. Hajarika, ma'am, to inaugurate this session. Over to you, ma'am. Thank you. Namaskar, ladies and gentlemen. And uh, thank you so much, all of you present here. It is my privilege to welcome you 
Honorable Resource Persons and the most valued participants to this webinar. We are very fortunate to have two resource persons from two unique places. One from California, United States, and another from the Azmir of Rajasthan, India. They were invited to share with us on the topic measuring economic development, accounting for natural wealth. As you know that California is the fifth largest economy in the world and the 37th most populous as of 2020. Our first resource person's workplace is California. I extend my cordial welcome to Professor Sudhir Thakur of California State University. Sir, I welcome you to this webinar organized by the Department of Geography and the IPAC of our college. One of our honorable research person is belong to Azmer, Rajasthan, India. The place Azmer always reminds us of the glorious chapter of the Rajput Kings. I extend my warm welcome to our second research person, Dr. Monica Khannand, HOD of Geography, Sophia Girls College, Ajmer. Welcome, ma'am, to this third international webinar and ninth in series of our college. Now I extend my heartfelt welcome to all the participants to today's webinar. I also extend my warm welcome to, to all the participants who are not in Google Meet, but accessing this event through YouTube. I wish this webinar a great success and hope you will enjoy it. Thank you again. Have a good time. Thank you. Thank you, Principal Ma'am. Welcome and very good morning and evening to everyone. I, Dr. Anjan Kumar Talukdar, will now introduce our resource person, Professor Sudhi Thakur. Professor Thakur sir, welcome to today's international webinar. Thakur sir is the professor in the Department of Finance, Insurance and Real Estate at the College of Business Administration, California State University, CSUS, California, USA, and as a faculty at CSUS for 15 years and also teaching experiences at Mielo College of Business and Economics, CSU. Fullerton University of North Dakota, Grand Fork, Kent State, and Ohio State Universities. Sar has received school education in business from Delhi, BA in economics and mathematics from Delhi University, MA in economics from Punjab University, MA in urban planning from Akron University in 1998, and PhD on economic geography from the Ohio State University in 2004. Sar has interested in research, broadly focused on economic geography, economic development, natural resource analysis, and quantitative methods, regional economic structure, spatial statistics, and Indian economy are his substantive research inquiry areas. Sar has published six co-edited research books and 23 journals articles, and as well as book chapters. Among them, spatial diversity and dynamics in resources, and urban development in 2015-2016, and urban and regional development and training in 2020. Sar has a consultant with the World Institute of Development Economics Research and Developments of Insurance. Regional Development Planning Specialty Group awarded him the Distinguished Service Award and Emerging Scholar Award in 2007 and 2011, respectively. Sar has delivered the prestigious r and Memorial Lecture at the University of Allahabad in India in 2018. Professor Thakur advocates the view that knowledge is power and it should be utilized to unite people, bring prosperity to humanity and not divide and perpetuate inequality. Now, I request Professor Thakur sir to deliver his valuable speech. Thank you, sir. Sir, you are not audible. Hello, Thakur sir. 
Hello, sir. Hello, Hasan, sir. You are not audible. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Now you are audible. Okay. The uh, headphone was creating a problem. Okay. So let's get started. Can everybody see the slide now? Can everybody see the slide? No, sir. Not yet coming. No, sir. You can see the slide now? No, sir. No, sir. Yes. yes, sir. Now coming. Okay. Sorry about that. Um, let's get started. So, good morning to everybody and Namaskar. Um, I have been introduced uh, to all of you by the members of the college. Um, thank you for welcoming me. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to talk. So the topic that I have uh, chosen to talk today is measuring economic development, accounting for natural wealth. Before I get started, I'd like to ask a few questions. Why am I giving this talk? Um, I'm giving this talk to answer three or four big overarching questions. What are these questions? What explains economic progress and development? What are the various approaches and measures to analyze economic development? Are these measurements adequate? Are we missing something? What about the role of nature? Nature and its role in economic development. Are we truly including the nature's role in development and measuring the loss of uh, nature by depletion and, uh, and degradation. Are we accounting for that? And then I also, as an economic geographer, I'm interested in the geographical patterns of development. So these are the big questions that I would like to uh, answer today. And so here's the outline of my talk. I will briefly discuss what is development. I would take a look at some of the approaches to economic development. What are the measures of economic development? Is environment and ecology not national wealth? Um, and then I'm going to look at a sample of six or seven countries and see where they stand. And then I would make some conclusion. So, Let's talk about uh, development and its meaning and the variety of meanings uh, that often people utilize to understand development. So the, the idea of development or the notion of development includes a lot of things, okay? It has many dimensions, economic, social, political, cultural uh, dimensions of development, there can be legal aspects of development or administrative aspects of development. 
So development has many, many different sides, but I'm interested in economic development. And so economic development to me is not really equivalent to this vast idea of development that I've just talked about. Economic development is only a part of the total development. One defines economic development as a process by which real per capita income rises over time. So if the per capita income of any country increases over time, then we say that uh, there is development taking place because uh, the income levels per capita for everybody is increasing. So we are enjoying the benefits of a higher uh, income. But then we also qualify the statement by saying that real income should rise with the stipulation that the number of people below the poverty line should not be increasing. So if per capita in income is increasing and if the number of people below the poverty line that is also increasing, then perhaps there is some problem. There is problem of distribution, uh, problem of not being able to include everybody to enjoy the fruits of development. So yes, uh, economic development is increase in real income per capita, but also we have to take care of people below the poverty line that should diminish, that should not increase. So what I want to say that economic development is not the same thing as total development. In fact, I would say that economic development consists of two parts. There is the qualitative aspects of economic development, and then there is the numerical aspects of economic development. Qualitative aspects would mean that one's lifestyle has changed, one has, uh, uh, one has a better quality of life, uh, the overall process of development, the social change is taking place, uh, uh, all of the problems that we see, those are being slowly and gradually taken care of. But besides that, there has to be an increase in numbers in terms of income. So economic development to me is increase in income as well as a qualitative change in the human beings' lives. And so with this background on, on what we mean by economic development and what is the difference between economic development and economic growth, here are some, uh, some of the approaches that we often analyze to study economic development. And I'll go through each of these approaches in the different slides briefly, not too much in detail, but nevertheless, you must have heard about these. Uh, uh, you, might, you might be teaching these in your classes as well. But then nevertheless, this is, a, uh, uh, this is a broad canvas that I'm utilizing to understand the various approaches to economic development. So Kuznets inverted U curve, the Rostow stage growth model, structuralist approach. Friedman is a geographer, Friedman's space economy model. Amartya Sen, who everybody knows, his exchange entitlement approach. And then there is the Marxist approach to development. In particular, I would briefly comment on David Harvey, the most leading geographer in the world who has been researching this topic for almost 50 years. So let's take, talk about the first uh, approach to economic development. Uh, it is known as the Kuznets inverted U-curve. Simon Kuznets, who developed this uh, approach, was a professor at the Harvard University, uh, and he won the Nobel Prize in economics because of his contributions to understanding uh, economic growth, uh, social structure, and the process of development. And in doing this research, he developed this inverted U-curve hypothesis. What is this inverted U-curve hypothesis? On the right-hand side, you see in the figure it is inverted, but does not necessarily look like a U-curve because the lines on the side are not straight. It is, it is increasing. So what this graph or what this figure or what this curve is showing us, that as economic development takes place, at the initial stages, the inequality increases. And then when, a, when the development reaches a certain level, a high point, there is a turning, there is an inflection, there is a change. And after that point, 
Simon Kuznets observed in a lot of different countries that inequality diminishes with increasing economic development. And that means that when an economy attains a certain level of economic development, the government uses redistribution mechanisms, uh, perhaps uh, employment, uh, perhaps through taxation, perhaps through different programs, that it redistributes the wealth so that the fruits of development is shared by other people as well. So this is what uh, Simon Kuznets in his uh, research in the 1970s, this is how he came up with this inverted U-curve hypothesis. So um, Simon Kuznets then says, in his words, he's saying that uh, as economies grow, the relative income inequality increases during the early stages of development and then reaches a peak and then declines during the later stages of development. He also did this analysis cross-sectionally, meaning he took several countries and he wanted to examine how this uh, development and inequality relationship holds. So in a cross-sectional analysis of different uh, groups of countries from around the world, he tested this hypothesis. And he found uh, two interesting patterns. The first pattern was that higher inequality on the average, he found higher inequality on the average in the less developed countries compared to the developing country, developed countries. And then he also found within the group of the lesser developed countries or the poorer nations, there, were, there was lower average inequality in the most poorest compared to the relatively less poor. And so this was uh, the observation that he found in a cross-sectional, meaning at a given point in time, a sample of different countries from around the world. So the Kuznets hypothesis has been uh, very popular since the 1970s. People still do this research. I will come back to this idea a little later when we talk about environment. Uh, there's another hypothesis that is known as the environmental Kuznets curve. We'll talk about that a little later. And then the second uh, model that I want to talk about is the Rostow stage model. Again, this is a very popular uh, stage model. The, uh, this was developed by W.W. Uh, w. Rostow in 1961, uh, who divided the growth process into five stages. This was a linear a teleological approach to development where uh, Rostow said that all economies in the world would go through these five stages. The traditional society where, where the economy is uh, very uh, relevant to a, an agricultural type of an economy where people produce uh, 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 farm products from the agriculture. There is not much of manufacturing. Manufacturing takes place in the preconditions for take up. There is more exchange between the agricultural sector and the manufacturing sector. And then there are uh, some sectors within the economy. For instance, in India, in the 1960s and 70s, steel was very important. Steel was like the backbone of the economy. Steel uh, uh, products and steel was exported, and steel was the sector that really allowed the Indian economy to kind of take off uh, with the, the manufacturing of steel. And then economies uh, move into the drive to maturity stage. This is where savings and investment are very high. People are are enjoying a better standard of living, better education, better health. And then the last stage is the um, high mass consumption where there's plenty for everybody to go around to consume goods and services in plenty uh, for the entire population. So Rostow in his, in his, in his uh, approach, he tried to attempt to generalize a sweeping history of economic development. He thought that every economy would go through these five stages. Uh, that means the current underdeveloped countries would follow the Western de developed countries by following this uh, stage model. But uh, things are not all that simple. Things are not all that simple. The Rostow model of economic development uh, met a lot of criticisms. People started saying that 
this is a teleological uh, approach, which means that you know the end when the economy has just started. That means that when the economy is in the, in the tradition society state, you know that a couple of decades down the road, you would attain uh, the drive to maturity. And so in that sense, it was a teleological thinking, meaning the end product, the end stage would be visible once the economy has started in stage one. A lot of criticisms have been made uh, against this theory. It was considered to be mechanical. It did not have some inner logic to the progression from the first stage to the last stage. It was an ahistorical uh, model. Uh, it was not uh, tested cross-sectionally. Uh, and, and so it is ahistorical in that sense because it doesn't, does not include space. It was also very ethnocentric, meaning that it was based on Western experience and the, uh, the, the, the Eastern world, the African world, the South Asian world, the Latin American world is very different from the very advanced uh, economies in Northern Europe uh, and North America. And so it was a very ethnocentric approach. And so this is a criticism against the Rostow state model. And then came the structuralist approach to development. Um, in a very simple way, economic structure could be defined as uh, the composition of the various components of the macro economy, the aggregates, meaning uh, what is the size of the exports and the imports and uh, how much of industrial output is being produced, how many homes are being constructed, how many buildings are being constructed, uh, what is it, the level of social infrastructure. So it consists of economic structure basically consists of the various components of the macro aggregates and the changes that are taking place within these sectors in terms of their size, of their magnitude, and its overall relationship with this circular flow of income. There were others who were thinking about the structuralist approach to development as well, especially by the Latin American uh, economist, Raul Prebisch. He provided this thesis, hypothesis, which is known as the single privilege thesis of adverse terms of trade. What this means is that uh, less developed countries would never be able to make it to the top because there is an adverse terms of trade against the output that the less developed countries produce. And so less developed countries produce primarily primary goods that are, uh, that are resource based. And because in the Western world, there are synthetic substitutes to these products, uh, nobody wants to buy these, these goods. Uh, and, and so it, it, they have to sell it at a very low price. And so they are not able to get the right price for the primary products that develop, developing countries produce. And so there's an adverse terms of trade. So much of this surplus from the less developed countries is siphoned off through this adverse terms of trade. Economic geographers have done a lot of research. One group of economic geographers, which is centered in the University of Illinois in America, uh, there are Jeffrey Hewings and his colleagues and his students. They developed this idea of complexification. So if you look on the right-hand side graph, it shows that on the x-axis, as development takes place, initially, the agricultural economy would have very little trade. Everybody would produce something and consume it. If they have surplus, they're going to keep it for a later time period when perhaps the monsoons are not good and they're not able to produce. So they would basically produce and self-consume. So there was not much of exchange going on. But as the same economy progresses, then the manufacturing sector comes in, there is surplus. The agricultural and the manufacturing sector, the exchange goods, more development takes place and it goes up on the curve. It becomes a mature economy. There is the high tech sector. There is the artificial intelligence that comes in. And so there is more and more of interaction, inter-industry trade between the sectors. But when the economy becomes very mature, there is something that happens which is not very good. We call it the possibility of hollowing out, meaning that the economy has become so service sector oriented 
that it can basically buy most of the things from outside without producing it. So there is a hollowing out, meaning that all of the exchanges and the trades uh, are vanishing. And this has found to be true in a lot of mature economies like America and, and the European countries. So at the bottom of the slide, I present to you some of the characteristics of structural changes. For instance, the rate of increase of per capita output, quality of inputs changes over time, institutional arrangement improves, uh, agricultural and industrial sector go through revolutions, so on and so forth. So these are some of the changes that appear in the economy, which we call structural change that is taking place in the process of economic development. All right, so moving on, if you look at this graph once again, this is showing that when economic development takes place, uh, the, 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 the produce, the production from the primary sector declines with increase in development. In India, uh, much of the population is engaged in agriculture. So there's a large share of agricultural sector, although that has been declining. But in countries like America and Europe, uh, the agricultural sector does not produce so much. They are more into manufacturing and advanced uh, service or uh, what we call the fire sector, the financial insurance, real estate sector, that contributes more to the economy. Likewise, the manufacturing or secondary sector with low levels of development, the manufacturing is low, but as time progresses, as development takes place, manufacturing increases, it reaches a maximum, and then it starts to decline. So what happens uh, when development is very high? When, well, when development is very high, then the tertiary sector becomes very important. I'm sure you've uh, read about this and heard about this uh, in the news that the service sector is booming, meaning economies that have a high level of development, the tertiary sector, the service sector dominates. For instance, finance, insurance, real estate, so on and so forth. And then we come to the Friedman's space economy model. Another word that is often utilized is the core periphery model. So if you look at the map on the right-hand side, um, the red dots, the red little patches that you see, these are the places in the world that are highly developed in North America along the, along the eastern coast, in South America along, along the eastern coast as well, perhaps in Brazil or Chile, uh, North, North, Northern Europe, uh, the Nordic or the Scandinavian nations, uh, parts of Africa as well, and many parts of uh, India and South Asia are centers of, of core activities. So, so Friedman proposed a four-stage uh, core periphery model. The first stage is uh, when the economies are in a pre-industrial society where local economies flourish. Uh, and in the second stage, the core, meaning the northern countries in the, in the developed world, they interact with the uh, peripheral or the southern economies and there is exchange and through exchange, it gets uh, integrated and large part of the profit is siphoned off through this trade. And so trade does not benefit the periphery, it benefits the North. And eventually there is emergence of spatial integration. So we've seen in the past many decades, multinational corporations played a very important role. But, uh, uh, but as an example, let's think about the call centers. Well, call centers are basically the day-to-day -day routinized jobs. There's not much of innovation that goes on in call centers. So what the multinational corporations, what they do is that they keep the innovative activities in the, in the, in the, in the home country and they ship out all of the labor intensive jobs to the peripheral countries, which in a way does not, it gives employment to a lot of people, but it does not help in uh, shifting the innovation to the countries in the periphery. So this is what the Friedman space economy core uh, periphery model tells us about the global economy. Moving on to the, to the next slide, uh, we'll talk about the uh, Amorte Sense capability and exchange entitlement approach. Amorte Sen, he got the prize, Nobel Prize in 1998. He, uh, he's a professor of economics at, uh, and philosophy at Harvard University. 
While he was teaching in India at the Delhi School of Economics, he did much of the work because of which he got the Nobel Prize. He developed his theory of capability and exchange entitlement. The key word here is entitlement. He says in his study on poverty and hunger and global famine, he did a lot of research, a lot of publication. And basically what he says is that people are poor not because they don't have skills. They are poor because they're not getting employment. They're not getting their entitlement in exchange of the labor power that they have. They're not getting the job that will give them the money so that they can buy food and clothing and give the, uh, their children a, a, a good education. So it is the lack of entitlement, not necessarily uh, that the people are poor in itself and they're not able to maintain a decent living. So in the third point, you will notice I've written the approach, exchange entitlement approach suggests that each person has an entitlement to commodity bundles such as land, labor, power, and other resources. So he developed this exchange entitlement theory, which became very popular in helping us to understand poverty and famine. Um, Amartya Sen, along with his uh, colleague, uh, uh, John Drez, they wrote this book on hunger and public action in which they suggest a lot of different options that the state should play a very important role. Uh, there should be involvement of political parties and civic organizations uh, to, to combat uh, hunger and famine, nutritional deprivation, and the issue of class and gender. His thinking and his approach was later on utilized to develop the human development approach that has been producing and publishing the human development report at the international level. And I know that India publishes state level human development report utilizing uh, some of the thinking that Amartya Sen has provided. And then we want to talk about David Harvey and his uh, thinking about the global economy. He basically, in his writings, asks this overarching big question. Why is there geographical inequality in the global economy? Why is the North developed and the South underdeveloped? Well, on the right-hand side, you see a picture of the city of Toronto in Canada, which is a very highly modernized uh, 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 city in the world. At the bottom, you see a typical picture of a city from uh, Africa or Asia where the you have a city, you have a capital city, you have a metropolitan area, but the metropolitan area has this dual society, meaning the rich and poor coexist, the modernity and the, uh, the, the poor households, they live side by side. And so David Harvey, the geographer, has utilized the Marxian framework of analysis to understand some of these big questions that he is posing. He has written many books, one of the most recent books that he has written that came out in 2019 is The Spaces of Global Capitalism, A Theory of Uneven Geographical Development. So what, what Harvey is saying is that the outcomes that we see today, this broad division of poor and periphery in the North and the South, this did not happen accidentally. It is basically an outcome of the capitalist system that has prevailed in the world for many, many decades. So this is not an arbitrary outcome. It is, a, it is a systematic outcome because of the nature of the exchange relationship that has been taking place between the North and the South. And so he makes the argument that uh, because of the capitalist accumulation that is taking place in the, in the North, in the core, where profits and surplus value are siphoned off, uh, that is hurting the, the less developed and the poor countries. So David Harvey's approach is very powerful and one can spend an entire life trying to research David Harvey's writing. And, and, and he has done a lot of uh, writing on the Marxist approach to uneven geographical development. And then we get to the measures of economic development. So far I have talked about the different approaches but how do we measure economic development? So the first measure of economic development is the gross national product or the gross domestic product. Gross national product is defined as the sum total of goods and services, 
whatever an economy produces in, a, in, a, in, a, in an year, in a fiscal year, uh, how much of consumption has been taken place, how much of investment, how much of government expenditure, and you add the trade balance, that will give you the GNP, gross national product. This is a monetary value. If you take out the trade balance, then C plus I plus G is the gross domestic product. How much has a country produced in one year? And so GNP and GDP are related. The only difference is that uh, the, the, the trade balance is taken off from GNP to get the GDP. There has been a, a lot of criticism against the approach of maximizing GNP to attain a higher level of development. Why is that so? What, is, what are some of the reasons? Well, some of the reasons uh, for this criticism is that a GNP or a GDP approach, it's a price tag associated measure. You, you add up the monetary value of all the goods and services produced, and you say that, well, that is the GNP of a country. But what about the following situation? In the developed world, uh, uh, parents have more money, and so they uh, hire a tutor, a nanny, uh, to, to, to take care of their kids because they are so busy. And so the nanny gets uh, a salary. The salary is part of GNP. But in India, for instance, or other developing countries, many of these kinds of work are done by parents. I teach my kid. Uh, the mother takes care of the, of the, of the, of the baby. Nowadays, both uh, wife and husband are working, so they share the job of rearing the child, but they're not charging the baby, and so that money is, is, is spent for some other things. And so to that extent, the GNP is reduced. Compared to the Western world, uh, nannies are getting salaries, and so that salary is like an example of part of the GNP. Uh, in India or other developing nations, that is not so. Another criticism is that uh, developing countries uh, in, in South Asia and Africa and Eastern, Eastern Asia, uh, they are very dependent upon natural resources. And when an economy is very dependent on natural resources, there is going to be a, a ecological degradation or environmental degradation. Okay? There will be loss of natural wealth. Forests would be cut down. Wetlands would be lost. Estuaries will be lost. Uh, these economies, because of higher air pollution, will be contributing to a larger uh, global warming and climate change. What about the accounting of these uh, changes that are taking place because of, uh, because of countries trying to attain a higher level of development? What about equality and reduction in injustice and arms race? How do we quantify this? This is not taken into consideration when computing the GNP. And so if you're not doing this, then to that extent, either the GNP is underreported or it is overreported. Yet another example, a lot of uh, households and individuals in, uh, in less developed countries, the farmer produces for self-consumption. They do not go out and trade. And if they're not uh, trading it, then there's no money because what you're producing is what you're consuming. So that, 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 that produce, the equivalent money of that produce is not going uh, into the calculation of GNP. So GNP is, is limited. It is, it is restricted. So there has been a lot of limitations of maximizing GNP as a model of development. And that is why uh, one is seeking alternatives. One is seeking alternatives. So the second measurement is known as the under five mortality rate. So it is also called the U5MR. Uh, this is a measure that was, uh, 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 that was developed in the uh, 1970s, uh, the, per, uh, the per capita life index uh, to measure the overall quality of life. And then came, came U5MR. It is the number of deaths of infants and children under five years old per 1,000 per 1, live births. So if you look at the figure, it shows that the highest children uh, dying has been in India and South Africa consistently across the three time periods, although India has uh, reduced the under, under five mortality rate from 126 uh, per thousand to 37 per thousand in 2018. Uh, the countries that have uh, really controlled the, the, the uh, U5 MR deaths 
uh, are Denmark and, and Finland and the USA, as you can see in the graph. And then there is the Human Development Index. This idea was developed by South Asian scholars. Amartya Sen was very influential in developing the Human Development Index. This report has been coming out since 1990 uh, every year. It questions the automatic links between income prosperity and improving the quality of human lives. Uh, again, if you look at the table on the right-hand side, uh, the last column would show that Denmark and Finland um, have very high positions. India and South Africa have uh, the least or the, the least rank amongst a group of 156 countries. And so the question is, uh, the human development approach focuses on the idea of distribution, providing capabilities, opportunities, improving the gender development or the gender empowerment so that women can participate in the process of development. I'll give you an example. It has been observed in research that if one's mother or grandmother is highly educated, then all the kids in the, in the household will be highly educated as well. It has such a huge and a tremendous impact on uh, families uh, progressing from, uh, from a less education to high education. And then came the index of economic freedom. So all of these new developments are taking place because people were frustrated with the uh, measure of GNP, maximizing the measure of GNP. So the index of economic freedom was developed in 1995 by the Heritage Foundation and the Wall Street Journal. Okay. And um, the index of economic uh, freedom, they utilize the assumption, the same assumption, the same thinking that Adam Smith utilized in his Wealth of no Nations uh, published in 1776. And so this assumption uh, reads as follows. If the basic institutions that protect the liberty of individuals to pursue their own economic interests results in greater prosperity for the larger societies. So uh, giving freedom to decide to make decisions in the sense of economic decision making brings more prosperity. But there has been criticisms to the index of economic freedom as well. Jeffrey D. Sachs, a development economist, contested this assumption and said that economic openness does not necessarily lead to high growth. So he wrote a book, The End of Poverty, 2006, and he showed that there's no correlation between countries' rating and its rate of economic growth. And he gave the example of Uruguay and Switzerland, which had very high ratings in the, Indian in the Index of Economic Freedom, but they were sluggish performance. And at the same time, China had a very poor rating, but it showed a very high economic growth. And so the correlation was missing between the ranking and growth performance. So here you see a map, the map on the right hand side, which shows the index of economic freedom in 2018. So the freest regions are in North America in green, Northern Europe, Iceland, United Kingdom, and Germany and Switzerland. The most unfree countries are in Asia and Central America uh, uh, with the, bay, with the, with the, uh, with the uh, uh, light brown color. And the repressed countries where economic freedom is very curtailed, it is very checked, that's in Africa and Central America as well. Globally speaking, Singapore stands out with a very high score and it's considered to be world's freest economy. And then recently, um, some eight years back, a new measure of development was uh, started and that's called the Gross Happiness Index. Gross Happiness Index. And this was uh, developed after a meeting took place in Bhutan uh, by Jeffrey D. Sachs and the Prime Minister of Bhutan, Jigme Thinley. And this index utilizes six levels of indicator, GDP per capita, freedom to make life choices, generosity, uh, healthy life expectancy, social support, income and trustworthy governance. And across all of these reports since 2012, there's a group of country that kind of stands out. And the statistical measurement uh, identifies the Nordic countries up in North uh, uh, Europe. These Nordic countries are Iceland, Norway, 
uh, Sweden, uh, Finland, and Denmark. These are the five countries which are known as the Nordic countries. And a few of these countries or all of these countries have been consistently in the top 10. For the past uh, uh, you know, eight years, Denmark and Finland have been really at the top. In fact, in the last two years, they have been taking the first position and the second position in terms of uh, being considered the happiest society. These countries, mind you, are not the richest, but they are the happiest. Uh, look at the table once again. U.S. is considered to be uh, the most advanced and mature economy with a very high per capita income. But look at the rank. They, they, they stand in the top 20. Uh, and more recently, the rank has been dropping from 18 to 19 to 18. And so they are within the top 20, but the rank has been dropping. Why is that happening? Uh, it is partly because of politics, because of lack of economic freedom, because of lack of trust in government, so on and so forth. So what are the reasons? We want to understand the reasons of uh, 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 why the Nordic countries are very happy. They are very happy because of the high quality of work they do. There is a work-life balance. Uh, they trust their government. There is a very high level of physical and mental health. There is support of family life in terms of getting uh, four months leave when a child is born. Uh, they get vacation paid by the government. Everybody has a free education. And they pay a huge tax and in return get a lot of benefits from the government. And so having talked about the various approaches to develop, now I'd like to bring in the idea of the role of nature in development. There was a report that came out in 1968. It's called the Limits to Growth. And they basically painted a very gloomy picture of the world economy that the Earth does not have capacity to, to, to absorb the increasing population. And we will someday uh, come to an end. So they painted a very gloomy picture. There were some other reports that were published. Uh, the Brundtland Commission report in 1986-87, Common Crisis, Common Security. And all of these reports uh, suggested that the Earth, Earth's carrying capacity uh, is, is, is dwindling. It cannot, uh, it cannot support the increasing population, and there will be calamity. Perhaps COVID-19 is a sign of that uh, a, a prediction that the limits to growth uh, made in the 1960s, the late 1960s. So clearly, um, economic geographers are very unhappy with this approach of maximization of gross national product as a model of growth. It is considered to be misleading. Why is it misleading? Because all countries in the world, they utilize their natural resources. They use their forests and watersheds and aquifers, and, and they pollute the atmosphere uh, uh, and, and the ecosystem. They consume the natural resource base. But once it is depleted, either you abandon it, you do not put a monetary figure into your gross national accounting. Okay, So basically, GNP is being overstated. Just as when we buy a house, after 10 years, it, it wears down. So we have to put the fixtures. We have to spend money to maintain the house. The same argument is made with the natural resources. We utilize the natural resources. It's going to get depleted. Aquifers are going to lose the water balance. So you have to, you have to put away the depreciation costs and account for that. Otherwise, your GNP will be artificially inflated. And that's the idea of bringing in the role of nature in economic development. So national capital is then defined as capital assets. They are part of assets, like the trees, the fish, the oil, the mineral, aquifers, ocean fisheries, tropical forests, and all of the services that the ecosystem provides to us in terms of hydrological cycle, uh, soil fixation, uh, 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 the carbon dioxide that helps us in trapping the, the, the uh, uh, CFC uh, rays from the sun, uh, and, 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 and the very important gaseous composition of the atmosphere. So Professor Das Gupta, uh, who is Sir Das Gupta, who is a professor at the University of Cambridge, he's retired, and he has written extensively on this matter of understanding the role of nature in economic development and trying to account for that. So when nations utilize natural capital in the production process, it is going to depreciate, all right? It is going to deplete. 
but we have to take an account of that depletion and not leave uh, as it is. In fact, the Run Plan Commission in the late 1980s very succinctly, very importantly said that all countries in the world should develop in such a way that it meets the needs of the present generation, but leaves at least what you have consumed for the next generation. Otherwise, the next generation will not have anything. And so they talk about sustainability and intergenerational equity, intergenerational equity. So this conceptualization of the role of national natural wealth in development, uh, uh, it begs this question. Are we, are we leaving sufficient for the next generation? Are we leaving, leaving sufficient natural capital? Because if we deplete it to an irreversible level, then the next generation is going to get nothing. Okay, the next generation is going to get nothing. So how much are we bequeathing? How much are we leaving for our uh, kids and grandkids uh, so that they can have a decent life as well? So there are two views that have been presented uh, in the literature. It's called the, uh, the, the weak sustainability and the strong sustainability. Partha Das Gupta defines inclusive wealth as the sum of three, uh, uh, three types of capital, produced capital, and that is the machine and the houses and the road, the infrastructure. Human capital is skill. Okay? We, 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 we get education to improve our skills. So human capital has a big role in, uh, in economic development. The same way in natural capital, the ecosystem, the wetlands, the forests, the air, uh, the fisheries, all of this uh, is for human consumption, but subject to the stipulation that it is regenerated. Okay, it is regenerated, or you are putting away money equivalent uh, money uh, to the to, to to match the depreciation and the loss. And so, weak sustainability basically uh, says that if natural capital is depleted. If you can produce more human capital, more skilled people, more produced capital, and if you have the balance, then that is weak sustainability. You are sustainable, but we are weak. But a lot of others say that if the natural capital is completely lost, then that is not right. That is not good for the next generation. Uh, you have to think of ways of, 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 of making sure that the next generation has the same amount of natural capital. And so this implies that non-substitutable natural capital needs to be preserved and not depleted. The figure on the right-hand side is the environmental Kuznets curve. And this says that as development takes place, initially, environmental degradation is going to increase. As one pe peaks, uh, there is going to be a turn, and environmental degradation is going to reduce. Um, figure 7, uh, 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 figure 24 in the table 7 on the right hand side, this is the data on India. So in India, the total wealth has increased between 1995 and 2014, uh, almost 108%. Produced capital, machinery, buildings, roads, they have increased by 150% in the same uh, time period. Natural capital has not increased so much, it is only 80%. And so basically, uh, natural capital has been accumulating at a very slow pace relative to produce and human capital. In 2012, Partha Das Gupta and others in the, in the world, they came up with an inclusive wealth report, and they developed an inclusive wealth index. That is the sum of produced capital, human capital, and natural capital. And as you can see on the right-hand side on the table, Denmark and Finland stands out. They are at the top, India and South Africa in this small sample is really at the bottom. But then I want to talk about forests. Forests are very important because a lot of poor families, they dwell on forest products. Their livelihood depends on forests. So there are three uh, uh, terms that I want to bring to your attention, and that is sustainable development, uh, sustainable economic development, and, sus and regional sustainable development. I want to, in the interest of time, I will uh, define regional sustainable de development uh, so this is a kind of development which ensures that the regional population can attain an acceptable level of welfare, both at the present and in the future. And this kind of development is compatible with long-run ecological preservation. 
this slide over here, let me go back to the uh, previous slide. And so on the right-hand side, you see that I have computed the shares of the uh, forest coverage by regions in India. So basically, the, 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 the most prominent region that has a large forest cover is eastern and, and central. And at the bottom, you see the picture of lush forests in Assam. Uh, very, uh, very, uh, uh, you know, thick and dense forest in Assam. This slide over here shows us uh, from the uh, report, from the, uh, the report that was prepared by a high-level committee in 2013 or 14 under the chairmanship of Dr. Das Gupta from Cambridge University. He showed that it is possible to create a, uh, a, a gross national product that takes into account the loss of ecological and environmental degradation. So this is an example where it has been demonstrated that one can compute the, the, the green adjusted GNP that reflects the real picture of the state of the economy. So here in the last slide, I have brought together all of the information on the same page. So there have been many, many uh, uh, ways, many approaches, many efforts to quantify economic development. Uh, the Human Development Report, the Inclusive Wealth uh, uh, Report, the Economic Freedom Report, the World Happy, uh, Happiness Report. What stands out is, is that you don't have to be the richest country to be the most happiest or to be the most developed. Because as I said earlier, the Nordic countries Denmark, Finland, uh, uh, Iceland, and 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 Norway, uh, these are the uh, these are not the most richest country, but yet they are the happiest. They are the most satisfied. They are uh, very highly developed. But countries like India and South Africa, amongst many other developing and less developed countries, they have to work very hard in terms of improving the conditions. Of the, of the human beings. Singapore is also an example that is right at the top. US is amongst the top 20, but because of people's lack in the government, uh, uh, the poor not doing very well, the African-American population, the lat Latino population not doing very well, uh, the rankings have fallen in the last couple of years. So with that, I want to conclude by saying that Development is a very complex and a multidisciplinary concept. Economic development is one kind of development which implies the process by which per capita income rises, subject to the stipulation that the number below the poverty line does not increase. I have talked about, at least given you a brief idea about the various approaches to analyze economic development. Uh, I have talked about the several measures to quantify economic development, and GNP is a very misleading uh, 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 measurement of development. And so all of these new ways uh, have been developed, especially the one that takes into account natural capital. And we notice a geographical pattern that Denmark, Finland, USA, Singapore are, uh, are at the top, including South Korea, India and South Africa, and many other Asian and African countries are not doing very well. And so they have to really work very hard. And with this, I kind of end my uh, discussion. Hopefully, I did not take uh, uh, more time uh, than required and then given to me. So let me um, stop share. All right, uh, I hope that you all have uh, listened to my talk. Uh, it is the end of my talk. And um, I'd like to welcome any questions or later on you can uh, pose questions. Hello, Kimi. Go Thank on. you so much, sir. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, You're welcome. Yeah, sir. Thank you so much yes. for your resourceful deliberation. It is really a thank wonderful you, presentation. You, okay, sir. Now, I yes. Dr. Mokhi is going to introduce our second research person, Dr. Monica Kanal. Dr. Okay. Kanal 
He is an associate professor and head in the Department of Geography, Sophia Girls College, Azmir, India. She is engaged in teaching and research for the last 16 years, contributing specially in the area of prime mapping and analysis, geopolitics, gender issues, juvenile delinquencies, and border disputes. She has two hard credit seven books and nearly 60 research papers in journals and magazines of national and international repute. Dr. Kanan has received several awards, such as the Certificate of Excellence by Trans Congress Paris, Certificate of Merit by Rajasthan Public Service Commission, Dr. Rajasthan, India and National Young Geographer Award for her exemplary contributions in the field of research. Dr. Kanan is the chief editor who is the International Peer Review Journal of Geography. Besides being on the editorial boards on several other journals, she is the principal investigator for ICSSR major projects. Dr. Kanan has been a consultant for Institute of Development Studies, Jaipur, Rajasthan, and by Institute of Social Science, Mumbai, for the Urban India Reform Facility, Azmir and Pushkar project. She has been certified by Harvard, Cambridge, USA, and Indian Institute of Remote Sensing, Dehradun, India, under the NNRMS program with specialization in geopolitics. Now, I request Dr. Monica Mem to deliver her speech. Over to you, Mem. Monica Mem, over to you. A very good morning. A very good morning to everyone. The chairperson and principal of Narangi Anchalik Mahavidyalaya Guwahati Assam, Professor Rita Datta. The IQAC coordinator, Dr. Rita Sharma. Coordinators of the event, Dr. Anjan Kumar and Dr. Lakshmi Gogoi. And all the other members who are associated with organizing this event and the dear participants. A very good morning to you and accept my congratulations for organizing this international webinar on a very pertinent topic. Thank you for inviting me and giving me an opportunity to address this August gathering. Kindly permit me to share my slides. Is my screen visible to you? No, no, ma'am, not visible? Yet. Yes, yes, ma'am. Okay. Okay. The topic that I've taken up for my session today is the role of women in rural transformation and how women in the society has contributed, has played, played a vital role in enhancing the economic development of a region and how she is very, very accountable for taking care of the nature, the natural wealth that we have in the society. So basically, I'm going to divide my session into two aspects, where one would be like a curtain razor, just to have a glimpse of the particular sex that we are discussing, women, what are what is the situation of women at, at the moment, what is the situation, the position of women in the society, specifically in the South Asian region that we are situated in, and secondly, I wish to present before you an exemplary example of a place named Tilonia, which is situated in Ajmer. I wish to express how the females in the society there are playing a vital role in enhancing the economy of the region, despite all limitations which, are, which can be possible for anyone. So beginning with my presentation, I begin with expressing that uh, as you are aware that we are all situated in the South Asian nations, one of the nations is our country, India. And there are approximately 48% of women living in this region. But unfortunately, due to the patriarchal values here and the social norms, the gender inequalities here are still alive because of the discriminatory practices these practices begin for a female even before birth and are affecting her life even after her death. Moving on to the next slide, I wish to mention 
that if we are comparing the status of a women and uh, men in the society, and I just want to discuss how women have explicitly contributed in, in economic development, I wish to express as an eye opener the females, the women that we are discussing in the society, what are they facing in our own country? There are many women who are still illiterate, exploited, excluded, and discriminated, and seen as a burden on their families. Despite the fact they are situated in Rajasthan, Tamil Nadu, or Assam, situations could be situatedness dependent, slightly varying, but situations are still scary for many of us. There are women, approximately 45 million women and girls who are missing in India. Approximately 5.4 million girls who are married at the age before 18. Approximately 10 girls every minute are experienced to, have, to be having vulnerable violence and exploitation. There are around 66,000 women who die from preventable maternal deaths. Approximately 32 million children who are going to the school, who step into the school at their primary level, their numbers, especially for the females who are admitted at the primary level, their numbers deteriorate, that is, decrease by the time they reach their secondary levels. If we talk in comparison to the social issues or the crimes that are prevalent in the country, specifically against women, the records are astonishing. We get to see there are states like Rajasthan, Andhra Pradesh, UP, so many more who are recorded, registered higher in the number of molestation cases, in the number of murders, rapes, and domestic violences that a female receives in the society. I am a geographer basically, so I cannot present it without maps. This is just a glimpse of the rate of increase of crimes and social issues in the country, in the state that I'm coming from over the years. The different kinds of social issues and crimes that a female come across, I've just put on screen, which are the registered ones in the state. There are so many more which are unregistered. So after just this brief glimpse, just a brief curtain raiser about the situation of women in the state, I wish to mention this woman who is facing a lot of social as well as crime issues in her life, how she has empowered herself, how she has geared up and strengthened herself and has started contributing in the economic development of the society. I wish to present before you an example of this institution, which is known as the Barefoot College, and how this place, the women working in this region, have brought light to their dark lives. When I begin my presentation, I wish to mention that this is basically an informal college. We have colleges, you have one, I am hailing from one of uh, the autonomous colleges in the state, which is Sophia Girls College as mayor. Even this place, this name, the Barefoot College, is a name of a college which caters to people who do not even have footwears to wear. So the name is symbolic in that term, which is Barefoot. When I'm presenting this um, college to you, when I want you to experience this place and how women in this region are doing something remarkable. And this is especially being addressed to the urban women, to all those women who are there on board at the moment, be it the resource persons or the organizers or the participants. The women here who are simple villagers, who are mainly illiterate, who have faced poverty in their life, who have faced unhygienic situations in their life, who have been facing N number of social issues and rituals and uh, patriarchal norms being imposed in their lives. They have tried hard. They have uh, geared up themselves and made an attempt to bring some light to each of their lives. As I said, I'm a geographer, so it's difficult for me to explain something without a map. This is basically the uh, map of Izmir city where this unique college, the Barefoot College, is situated in a place called Pilonia. I just wish to give you a brief scenario, the brief history of this place. 
Uh, there was this man, uh, Mr. Bunker Roy, who was a Delhi University graduate. He came to this region, Thelonia. He was just passing by. He came for a survey, a field visit. He happened to come to Ajmer and he realized when he moved around the region, Thelonia, it is in Kishangarh Ajmer, that the people here are facing a lot of poverty issues. They are facing a lot of uh, issues wherein the sex ratio is very less in the society. Where there are a lot of social taboos and stigmas in the society. People are skilled, but then they are unemployed. As my former speaker just mentioned, where we need to harness and tap the right skills in society. Where there are females, but then there are illiterate. Where for a female, the only assigned task in the society is take care of the home, take care of the family, the children, and the elderly people, and that is done. You're not supposed to earn. Even if she wants to earn, she's not capable enough. She is not well read enough. So this particular person, when he came across this region, he was very, very visionary. So he contacted the government people here. He strived hard and with great difficulty in the year 1972, he managed to establish a research center here. And the research center was named as a SWRC, which was a social welfare research center. Those days he has, he had taken up this uh, land with a, you know, a one rupee lease from the government. And when he established, and he was gradually moving ahead to establish this place, he said, let's be the change you want to see in the world, in the words of Mahatma Gandhi. And let's have a look, all as all of us on board, I can see 100 people here, we're all well read. We're all coming from good families and societies. We feel we're all empowered. We feel we are, because we are backed up by, uh, uh, good places to live in. We have food, water, shelter to ourselves. I want you to have a glimpse, to have a ride with me through this presentation and have a feel what a village female who is illiterate, who doesn't even know she'll get food in the evening for her or not, for her family or not, what she has done to herself, done to the family and the society at large around her. This place, when it was established, they had a vision to identify the social and the economic factors which can provide a solution to this place. Bunker Roy, with his team, wanted to focus on academic excellence through innovative technologies here. I still wish to remind and repeat this, that this was a basically a rural area with sand dunes all around, with shrubs, and hardly any fertile land around, with less or no water availability, with, with children not going to schools, with hardly any options or possibilities for employment in this region. The core belief of this area, this institution, is that the knowledge, the skill, and the wisdom which is found in the villages, in the amongst the villagers, should be utilized for their own development, their own knowledge, their own skill, and their own wisdom. This was a belief where they created this demarcation, let's segregate, let's separate literacy from education, and a belief to empower and to provide quality of life to the women in society. I wish to be, I feel very proud to mention that today, this place after nearly approximately 40 years of hard work and sweat, has managed to establish a proper infrastructure to itself. I will request if there is anybody, maybe after the lockdown, after the corona pandemic period, if there is anybody who is planning to come over to any, any place near Rajasthan or MP, I wish, I request, I can arrange it for you. Please come and visit Telonia, where you have offices made in a shape of an igloo which do not have a fan or an AC inside in the hot desert of Rajasthan and that igloo manages to keep itself cool. The kind of infrastructure that you will find in this place is amazing, which is handmade, which is made by the villagers of this place. They have managed, the villagers, the rural people here have managed to get themselves a guest house, a library, a dining room, some meeting halls and an open air theater. These things feel very, very ordinary when we talk in an urban perspective. But my dear academicians, I wish to repeat and remind just the rural background. 
This place has a post office, a craft shop, developmental centers, internet cafe, yes, you heard it right, a puppet workshop center where rural women are making puppet and running their own puppet shows and earning livelihood to themselves. An audio visual unit, a screen printing press, yes, this place has started publishing and printing booklets. They have a website also a dormitory for residential trainees because now this place has trainees from out all over the world this place trains women from nigeria from uh, taiwan from japan from africa so many african nations from indonesia from thailand i just come across in the, like my coming slides they have managed to utilize the uh, rural irrigation techniques by building johars and takas and anikids and I'm using these three terms, they are basically uh, the different rural irrigation techniques that we have in Rajasthan, Johars, Anikids, and Tankas. They have also managed to build huge rainwater harvesting tanks because as you are well aware about the stage and the amount of rainfall that we receive, so it's very, very essential for us to preserve the water, the only water that we get. The village and the college is electrified now by solar panels. So we are striving hard in this particular place to utilize whatever is available. Just a map to show how Thelonia, this place, Barefoot College, was in the earlier days, and now it has expanded and opened its, its wings to soar higher and higher. Beginning with the first important aspect, this place has started developing and deploying power generation, solar power bags, uh, solar power and biogas generating power and photovoltaic cells for generating electricity in the night schools and dispensaries. With this, I wish to highlight that this place has morning schools and night schools also besides dispensaries. They have established a women barefoot solar cooker engineers society as it is very very evident in that picture that you can see in that uh, that uh, rural female who's sitting behind she's a uh, like a not very literate person but then she is uh, she has managed to develop her skills and she's working as an engineer in this place presently barefoot has managed to collaborate with the ministry of new renewable energy Indian Renew Renewable Energy Development Agency Limited, the Indian Technical and Economical Cooperation, and United Nations Special Commonwealth Assistance for African Programs. Just a small place, started with a lease of one rupee by one man, and now it has soared high. The Women's Solar Cooker Engineer Society Association, they have been performing a lot of activities. There are women who come and attend meetings, who are not very well, well versed with language, that is English. Uh, so they basically use the local dialect. The local dialect there is Marwari, which is the local Rajasthani language. And they have their small, small meetings in those in that uh, local dialect where they put up solar cooker exhibitions in the state capital, Jaipur, and many parts of the country where they design and redesign and update their solar cookers. They repair the old solar cookers by going from place to place, moving from place to place, and uh, by running campaigns and exhibitions. I have highlighted in a dark color, which says 20, 21 women from six countries are recently working on this. There are women, as you can see, old women who are not been uh, through a formal training process, who have not uh, gone to engineering schools or colleges. They have just enhanced their, uh, what Pankaroy basically did. He called upon some engineers, he called upon some training uh, trainers, organized training camps, requested and pleaded the women in society and the men in society. It was really very difficult to convince and to persuade the people uh, who since years had a specific uh, thought process and now suddenly you are asking the females to move out of house and start learning something no matter what age. As you can see, this is an old woman of approximately plus 50s and she's sitting here and trying to uh, make and repair solar panels and solar cookers. So this is something very commendable and something which I am very, very proud of. 
There are rural women who have started deploying solar lighting and uh, enhancing some uh, economic generation avenues for them. I wish to proudly mention that Barefoot College made a modest beginning with 145 watt mini solar plant and has now become the first fully solar electrified campus in the whole rural India. This is commendable. This electrification process has moved across, has spread across nearly 751 villages in 16 states in the country, in the country and 20 other underdeveloped countries. Nearly 2 lakh people have been provided with clean energy globally. I am sure we all Indians specifically will be very, very proud about this initiative. This is uh, again a very, very wonderful concept which even I visited and I was amused, com completely amused about. This is a place where uh, the women who reach to this, like uh, the different uh, women from different countries, from Nigeria, from uh, uh, Taiwan, from Indonesia, from Cambodia, from Laos, all these people, all these women come together and this is like a training center for them. And you'll be very, very like surprised, I wish to share this, how they are learning. I'll tell you, I'll give you an example. Once I visited this place and I was asking, um, you, have, you are catering to so many women together from so many different nations. So language should have been the first constraint. How do you communicate? A woman coming from Nigeria, sitting across a Marwadi woman from Rajasthan, the third woman is sitting from Cambodia, somebody else from Laos. So how do you organize in the training sessions? Do you give them some language classes at the first? You know what they said? They said, we have charts made up we just teach them you join the red wire with the green wire you join the green wire with the black wire and this way you have to connect things these words red in written in the nigerian language in one chart so what you have to do is you just uh, you pick up wires you notice the different different the different different charts and you go on doing things just imagine women sitting across a common table who are not able to communicate with each other but just moving around the room if, if they move around the room there are so many charts placed wherein there are uh, translations for every word in their specific language to so just move around have a look and then start with that training and gradually they become very very well versed with it you can have a look of some more uh, uh, similar solar engineers here, some rural women who are trying to contribute to the economic development of their region. Approximately 202 women from villages in Africa have been trained as barefoot solar engineers in the year 2017. So this in institute is providing internships is providing project works, is providing training also to not just our Indian national, national people, but also to people from across the countries. Barefoot initiatives also include, they have fixed up some solar photovoltaic uh, units, developed solar lanterns, they have something called night schools, wherein electricity is provided and the list is endless. I can't be naming everything at the moment. So now they have, uh, this is something else, which is the solar powered desalination plant. I, as you must be aware that Rajasthan is basically a desertic state where the salinity present in the soil is high. So they have developed this system wherein um, it again gives me immense pride in mentioning that India's first ever solar powered reverse osmosis plant was installed by the Barefoot College, which now produces approximately 600 liters of water per hour for six hours every day, providing access to drinking water for over 1,000 villagers, which I feel is very, very commendable. The solar water heater plants that they have uh, made, I am sure you must be aware that there are so, uh, a lot of uh, rural women who face from um, a lot of uh, health issues when they are using the local handmade chulas. So smoke also becomes a hindrance in their livelihood, which is not very, very healthy for all, all the while uh, inhaling inside. So now this place, because they realized they were working on chulas, they realized and they were facing this problem. So they have overcome that, they have come up with it, and they have developed a smoke-free and eco-friendly source of hot water, as well as to generate employment 
keeping the nature hand in hand, still enhancing the economy of their own place by their own skill and wisdom. This is a, a very uh, unique concept. This is a Neer Jal, which is a water monitoring system they have developed. I am sure that you must be aware that there are some, uh, someone called a water charmer in the villages. Barefoot has implemented a Neer Jal website, which is basically contributing in water mapping in the nearby region where people from the rural community who are well versed with uh, water charming exercises who can predict where there is possibility of water underground. So they move around with these people and to mention urban smart uh, remote sensing and GIS trained professionals are working with these rural men and women and contributing to the same cause. As I mentioned in my initial slides that they are contributing, they're making uh, huge rainwater harvesting tanks. So since 2006, more than 73 collection tanks have been made constructed, which is contributing to nearly 1.5 million liters of fresh water to the children during the school hours. So they have come up with some schools as well. As uh, rural women are very, very trained with their skills, they know how to make puppets, they know how to make uh, different, different handicraft things, and they're all using their hands, which is, which we, in English, know as palm, but in Hindi, we call as hateli. So because they are using their palms and basic, making all these things, and to basically uh, give a term which is very, very related to them, they have developed a craft shop, which is named as hateli sansthan. Here, the rural women are engaged in making leather works, beavers, they're working as assistants, uh, they're working, they're contributing to generation of rural material by the leftover, by the torn uh, cloths, and whatever is available in the, uh, in the society, they're utilizing them and earning livelihood for themselves. Though these things might be sounding demeaning, but if you visit this place, it's extraordinary. Whenever uh, I find foreigners or maybe um, some uh, urban, uh, very highly urban people moving around the societies, when they happen to reach this Hateli Sanstan, I always remember them saying, they say these products are out of the world products. They can be easily exported as well. I am proud again to mention these products are still being exported also. There are many uh, barefoot females who are uh, moving to countries like America, moving to countries like France, and giving lectures in Marwari, which are being translated, and they are trying to empower the women there also and develop their skills as well. So the different activities that we, they are involved in, sewing, block printing, bandhes and dyeing, which is uh, Rajasthan very, very famous and popular about. They're making wooden toys, leather crafts and embroidery, quilts, you must have heard of, especially people in the country, India, they must be knowing, Jaipuri Razai or Jaipuri quilts are very, very famous, so they are making uh, them as well. They are uh, weaving dharis, which is like a doormat, and doing some patchwork, which is very, very popular in the society. They are working as craftsmen as well. Since 1975, more than 1850 rural women have been trained and they are working as barefoot artisans and weavers with just less or no training. So this is just an account of the Hateli craft shop. So what are the different activities that they're doing and uh, how many people are being involved there? Uh, as I mentioned, they have a open theater kind of a place. Uh, this is Mr. Bunker Roy and to demystify the concept of education and how it is very, very essential for each one of us in the society. He regularly organizes meetings where the entire village is called on for and irrespective of the religion, the caste that you are hailing from, irrespective of the high society or the low society you are coming from, they also could sit together, they have the meals together, interact, learn and develop themselves. They have a concept called Balwadi, which is rural crash. So if their fathers and the mothers are moving around for any kind of jobs or skills, I repeat, this is only for the rural women, the rural families. So if the women in the society are working as solar cooker engineers, or they're working as art craftsmen, so the children are sent here to the Balwadis 
where, wherein there are a specific uh, some trainers who take care of the who are responsible for the health, the hygiene, and the educational and social needs of each one of them. There are extracurricular activities also organized for them. This uh, particular concept, I seek your kind attention. It's something very nice. We, as uh, when we write, when we file our uh, IQAC reports as NAC coordinators, we come across something called a bridge course, wherein uh, we, I am sure you must be aware of what a bridge course is, which this is one term which is basically being referred when we are referring to NAC accreditation. Like I am also the IQAC coordinator here, so I can well understand the meaning. But this particular Barefoot, Col Barefoot College is also utilizing this particular term, which is a bridge transition course. I want you to pay attention to this when I, when I say every year, 25 to 30 boys and girls attend these courses. And after attending this bridge transition course, the children take up a written exam and join classes six in the mainstream educational system of the society. That means the rural children, the, the children who are otherwise, who are not going to schools, who are illiterate, who are poor, are brought up here, they are given some training, and they, it's made sure that they possibly manage to join the regular, the mainstream formal education system that we have in the country. Then we have a concept of day school here. Besides the day school, there are concepts of night school as well, where the learned children, the children who are basically competent enough to read and write, teach the elders. So there is no age bar, nothing, no, uh, the different uh, demarcations, the different categorizations that we have in the society of men, women, maybe rich, poor, maybe the caste or the religion, there is no such demarcation at barefoot. It just belongs to, to the one who are barefooted in the society. Uh, something which I was very, very impressed about when I visited to this place, and I keep going to this place, and I keep, uh, and I make sure that I take my uh, uh, students that I have here in uh, um, sophisticated environments to have a face-off for themselves because they feel that they are very, very uh, high class or developed or smart. So I won't always tell my students, let's have a feel at Thelonia, and when once you return from that place, I, we will have a quality check who is smarter, you are the one who is smarter, or maybe the rural women, you can have a look there, women who are not doctors, women who have not taken up an MBBS degree, women who are illiterate still, hardly they've been to the night schools or the day schools that they have, they are trying to enhance the economic economy of that region. Just imagine a team of barefoot doctors, health workers, midwives, pathologists and dentists with little or no educational backgrounds are trying hard to uh, develop some immunization camps in the region. They are putting up eye camps, they are putting up TB eradication camps, family planning camps, prenatal and postnatal care. I doubt if you call for a female here, the rural female here, if you, and if I happen to just ask what do you mean by prenatal, she won't be able to explain the meaning of prenatal, but yes, she can handle everything else beside the world. So this is what I want you to understand. Yes, they are. They have been uh, trained by the uh, senior and the professional and the trained doctors. And in cases of emergency or any serious illness, they are being referred to proper hospitals. This is again a very interesting concept. This is an FM radio center, which has been developed in the Barefoot College. As you can see, the background, and I seek your kind attention to uh, have a closer look at this background where this lady is standing. These are the egg shell trays, which are otherwise uh, disposed of after consuming the eggs. So we have eggs in our breakfast or maybe daily food. So these are the egg trays, which are laid inside the room to give a sound proof system. So this is ecology and economy together here at Barefoot. Here females, the old ladies or the young ladies, irrespective of their age, they communicate as radio jockeys, they tell stories, they uh, exchange all those dadimake nuskes and all those things that, that they are aware of using the Marwadi language in this radio community center for which they are paid. 
So they all pledge that we will um, together utilize our knowledge, our wisdom, and our skills to develop not just our region, not just our village, but the society and the nation at large. They have been contributing in agricultural extension programs, many women-oriented programs, animal husbandry. These are the different uh, initiatives of the Barefoot College. Uh, you can have a look uh, where they're in. There are uh, mother and child welfare schemes, family welfare programs, pathological laboratory programs, health camps, and many more. So this is the way your Telonia village, the Barefoot area, has developed and exponentially contributed, developed in uh, its own unique sense. Not just it has be, it has come up like a flat on the flashy screen of Ajmer, but also and at the country at large. After this uh, eye-opening session, I'm sure you must be wondering, who are the people behind all this? Fine, alone Bunker Roy cannot do all of this. He can start, he can be visionary, he can be creative, he can be the starting point or maybe the person who established the basic system, but the entire Telonia family is like this. We have Kalavateji, who's working as a field coordinator, center coordinator. We have Shehnaz working as solar cooker engineer. I want you to have a closer look of them. Uh, Sita, who's again a solar cooker engineer. Noraji, who's helping for the communications. Lalita, working for water mapping using remote sensing in GIS. Tejaram, coordinating the night school. And the list is endless. So they all have developed and made the system foolproof in their own unique sense. Barefoot is very, very proud about having multiple collaborations, not just with Indian organizations and bodies, but with UN Women, UNESCO, GEF, and has been receiving grants now. They have so many partners who all have acknowledged and realized the unique and the purposeful cause of this institution and how uniquely this place has come up. I wish to conclude my session saying, this place is a true example where a true development is taken up of the people, by the people, and for the people, which is an integrated approach to take in nature and economic development both hand in hand. I conclude saying, Karnesh Rasu, Karnesh Mantri, Bhojyesh Shamayeshu Dharitri, Satkarmanari, Satkarmanari. I want to remind you that this place was the same place where the women were deprived of their rights, where women was the one who was going to school. She was not permitted to step out of the family. Her work was assigned and assigned by the senior members in the house, mainly being a patriarchal society, the men in the family. And now she has placed, she has find a unique place for herself, for herself. And this beautiful Sanskrit statement refers to its real meaning, which means she works like a servant, her wife is like a minister, she feeds like a mother, and forgives like mother Oh, She is a true woman, a true human, an exemplary example of someone who's trying to take up nature and economic development together. With this, I sum up my session. Stay safe, stay blessed. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Monika Khannan, ma'am, for your informative and enlightened session. Next, we have to start our question and answer session. Thank you all of you for your active participation in the webinar. Since some of our students want to ask questions directly, as such, I would like to request Kompi Bora to ask her question. Kompi Bora, over to you. Yes, sir. So, am I audible? Yeah, you are. Hello? Yeah, Kompi, go ahead. Yeah, good afternoon, sir. Sir, my question is for Professor Sudhi Thakur, sir, and uh, myself, Kompi Bora, an ex student of Narangi Anshali College. And currently, I'm pursuing my master's degree from University of Science and Technology. 
So, sir, I would like to put forward my question that how natural wealth is measured and what are the most suitable methods that can be used for the developing countries like India? Hello? Hello, sir? Sir, please unmute your... Hello? Yes, can you repeat the first part of your question? What is natural what? I, I missed one word. Okay, sir. Sir, uh, my question is, how natural wealth is measured and what is the most suitable method that can be used for the developing countries like India? Okay, so um, measuring uh, natural resources um, is a complicated exercise because we are trying to put a price, a monetary value. So uh, one of the techniques, there are several techniques, but one of the basic idea of measuring the loss uh, of natural resources by consumption or by depletion, there is this idea called shadow prices. Shadow prices versus market prices. So market prices are determined in the, in the marketplace, interaction of demand and supply, and that, 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 that uh, sets the price and quantity at a given price. But, it, but if natural resources are resources that are not traded, it does not reach the market. So in order to measure the value of natural resources, one uses uh, ideas that have been developed by economists and, and, and the like-minded people, the idea of shadow prices. Shadow prices are the artificial prices that uh, we compute by comparing the uh, benefits and costs uh, in future, and we discount it using some discounting rules uh, that we often utilize in finance and, and uh, otherwise. So if you put money in a bank, over 20 years it's going to grow. And if you want to discount the value of that money 20 years henceforth, in today's terms, we use an internal rate of return or a shadow price mechanism from which we can compute the value. I don't say that's the actual value or it's an estimation, but nevertheless, that's the best that we can do. Answering the second part of your question, there are many, many different ways to, uh, to measure uh, depletion, degradation of natural resources. One of the most popular method, it's called natural resource accounting. It uses the same principle that uh, economists use in the Planning Commission or NITI or elsewhere, NITI IO, uh, where they develop a balance sheet of assets and liabilities. The only thing that is missing in that balance sheet is the natural wealth. What about the loss of aquifers? What about the loss of ocean reefs? What about the loss of fisheries and trees? So using shadow prices, you compute a price and then estimate how much has been lost and multiply it with the, with the shadow price. That gives you the monetary equivalent. So I think I've answered both your question but as I said earlier, there are many, many different methods. I'll just name a few that are often utilized by people in this area, something called multi-criteria analysis that is also uh, integrated with GIS, cost-benefit analysis, multi-criteria analysis, natural resource accounting analysis, entropy analysis. There are at least 10 different ways uh, that people, economists and policymakers and economic geographers can utilize in order to measure and quantify the depletion and degradation of natural resources. India has already started since the publication of uh, the Das Gupta Committee Report in 2013-14. I don't think they have released any copy, but they are trying to work on this mechanism to quantify loss of natural resources. I hope I've answered your question. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Kompi. Uh, uh, the second question is from Mili Parali, a student of Geography Department of Narangi Ansarik Mahavidyala. Mili, over to you. Mili, can I unmute your device? Good morning, sir. Good morning. Sir, am I audible to you? Yes, yes, yes you, you are audible. audible. A very good morning to uh, respected uh, Dr. Monica Khanan, ma'am, and to good evening to Sir uh, Sudhir Thakur, sir. Uh, 
myself Milly Bharali from Narangi Anshalik Mahavidyale. I'm from Geography Department uh, Honors. Uh, I'm from uh, sixth semester. At first, it's my privilege to be the uh, to be a part of this session uh, during this pandemic situation. And I would like to uh, raise one question to Dr. Monica Khanan, ma'am. That is, uh, how the uh, how has barefoot females empowered individuals, females, and communities? Ma'am, am I audible to you? Monica, ma'am, kindly unmute your device. Monica, ma'am. Yeah. Um. Could you please repeat the question? So is it uh, that you are trying to ask how barefoot institution has uh, contributing in developing females? Is that what yes, you're trying to ask? Yes, ma'am. Uh, thank you so much, Nimili, ma'am, for your question. Thank you, ma'am. As I mentioned in my presentation, yeah, as I mentioned in my presentation, basically this place is uh, to. Uh, convey any kind of gender inequality in the region. So they are catering to both men and female in the society. But incidentally, men in the region have many more options, like going in for Narega, going in for their agricultural works. That, that is the primary activities that they were otherwise performing. But the females were uh, left behind home and they had nothing to do besides taking care of the family. So this particular place has actually widened their horizon and they have added wind to them. They have uh, with basic training provided uh, on a very, very regular and on a consistent basis. Now they feel so very confident about themselves. Now they can stay back home. They can uh, move around the place. Gradually, uh, the society is also accepting them. They've started learning. They can feed their children as well. As I mentioned, there are females I met there uh, who have moved to America, who have moved to France and other places, and they are having, you know, having their own tra training sessions. And surprisingly, wearing those uh, in, in uh, like Rajasthan, our rural uh, dress, the rural village, village dress is lehenga. So they are wearing those lehengas raised on the uh, podiums and platforms in countries like America and delivering sessions. So I feel... Certainly, Bairu has immensely contributed in the development of the female there. Uh, thank, thank you, you ma'am. And Mili. Thank you, sir. Now, I would like to ask a few questions picked up from participant side. First question is for Sudhir Thakur, sir. Population explosion is the single cause of all problems in our world. How far you agree? <clears throat> um, I kind of agree and disagree uh, to this uh, point because uh, India is also known to be a place with a huge population that is a burden on the natural resources. So the, the uh, carrying capacity of the natural resources goes down and it cannot sustain. But then on the other side, uh, when, when you look at the world, uh, a lot of countries are losing population, their population is green. The larger percentage of population in developed countries are old people. They don't have young people. So it is often said that in India, a large percentage of young people is, is known as the uh, dividend or population dividend. It is not a curse, it is not a burden, but these are the people who are gonna be engaged with the right kind of training and human capital to work as a productive workforce in the economy in the years to come. I just read today that the prediction of uh, India, India's population projection is uh, uh, 1.6 billion by 2048. It is less than what is projected. And so I, I, have, I have mixed feelings about population. Yes, large population is a problem uh, uh, on, the, on, the, on the land's carrying capacity, on the resources carrying capacity. But on the same, uh, you know, the other side of the coin, it is also an asset. It is also a, an asset that helps to produce goods and services to help the aging population of the world and India. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Next question is for Monica, ma'am. What are the initiatives taken by 
you and other people to motivate the barefoot women of that village. Am I audible, ma'am? Monica, yes, ma'am? Yes, sir. Yes, yeah? sir. Could you please repeat the question? So, what are the initiatives taken by you and other people to motivate the barefoot women of that village? Uh, thank you, sir, for your question. Uh, at my personal level and at the level of the students that we have here and the community at large around me, what we have done we pay regular visits to Barefoot College which contribute in earning the entry fee which again leads to the development of the people who are dependent of this, that institution. So number one is the entry fee. We make sure to popularize this place the same uh, contribution I'm making at the moment, like I am addressing this August gathering and I'm making you all aware about Barefoot Institution and I put a lot of chats wherein there were participants who were writing, we will make sure to visit this place, Thelonia. So if anybody who walks in or steps into their door gives them an entry fee that has to be paid, so that is a revenue generation, one. Two, we make sure to popularize the Hateli Sansthan that is there situated in the place, so whenever we even at our institutional levels, we make sure to uh, purchase a lot of uh, items and popularize that particular institute that is uh, again being uh, led by a lot of females in the region. We all have of purchasing the lanterns and solar cookers of that region and uh, they are being kept and displayed in many exhibitions which we as a host institution are also organizing at our own place. So these are different initiatives that we are taking on our part. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you very much. Uh, next question is for Sudhir Thakur, sir. This is environment relation question. What are the major steps taken by US government to reduce environmental degradation? Um, US is going through a revolution, and that is uh, very political in nature. The current president, uh, President Trump uh, is not a believer in science. He does not believe in climate science uh, done by researchers. The global warming is happening. And so uh, the government perspective or the government stand is that uh, you must have read in the news as soon as he became the president, he withdrew uh, US from the Paris Agreement. Okay, So uh, US is not part of the, uh, the, the Paris Agreement on, uh, on climate change. Um, uh, uh, he, the president is a businessman, and so he looks at things from a business perspective. Um, so uh, trying to focus on alternative, the previous government w wanted to work on uh, clean technology, uh, not using fossil fuels or coal-based uh, energy resources. Uh, the current president uh, wants to utilize uh, technology that is not environmentally sensitive. So yes, it is very it is very important to protect the environment, but this is also a political question, uh, and the response currently is not very friendly with the environment because of politics. For instance, the Environmental Protection Agency (EPA) that's been filled with people uh, who are not very environmental friendly. Uh, these are the people who are very fossil fuel based, meaning uh, use oil to to make more profits uh, and, and use of oil is going to produce more gases that are harmful for the uh, air pollution and, and contributes to global warming. So, so US is, is going through a, a bad phase where the current government is not very environmental friendly. And so in a way they are contributing to a degradation of the environment. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Due to time constraint, I'm going to ask the last question to Monica, ma'am. Ma'am, is there any relation between gender inequality and economic development? Am I audible, ma'am? I could not hear. Okay. The difference between? Is there any relation between gender inequality and economic development? Uh, sir, I strongly believe that there is a strong relationship between gender inequality and you take it anyway equality or inequality that is gender biasness and economic development because uh, i read a few days back uh, uh, an article which said women still earns 
79% for every dollar that a man makes. During the COVID, there was a news which flashed that there are approximately 74% of female working in the service industry. But still, the amount of jobs that a female holds is much more than a man. The career jobs I meant uh, with low wages and with high job insecurity. So if even in our urban profile, if I talk, I feel gender equality or inequality, the biasness that we have in the society has a strong relationship with the economic development. Thank you, ma'am. This is the end of our QA session. Thank you very much, Professor Sudhir Thakur sir and Monica Kandan ma'am, for your positive responses. Now I request Minal Medi sir, highest principal and head of the Department of Geography, to offer vote of thanks. Over to you, Medi sir. Hello, Medi sir. Hello, it is her. Hello, I think uh, Medisar has some uh, network related problem. On behalf of Medisar, I am going to focus the microphone. Yes, so let me conclude. Okay. The perfect ending to any day, race, or project is to finish strong. It's my privilege to have been asked to propose a vote of thanks for this international webinar organized by Narangi Ansarik Mohammed. I extend a heartly vote of thanks to our district person, Supri Thakur sir and Monica Kandan ma'am, who blessed us with their presence and took us took out some time for us for their visit to the Both sir and ma'am were very specific about about and provided much valuable and updated information on today's topic, measuring economic development, accounting for natural wealth. The way they explained the topic was ex exemplary. Thank you once again, sir and ma'am. My heart is great gratitude to our principal, and IPC coordinator, Rita Sorma, ma'am, for providing encouragement and support, and also an opportunity to arrange this webinar. I heartily congratulate all the participants too for their active participation in the webinar. And last but not the least, as no program can become successful without a single person. Therefore, I express my big thanks to all my colleagues of my department and the entire American Solid Community members for making this webinar successful. Thank you.
now i request principal ma'am to wind up the program over to you ma'am thank you my sir uh, i want to express my gratitude to our research person professor thakur and professor uh, kannan uh, who who has uh, spent their precious time for us and grace this webinar uh, with their presence and uh, my special thanks to each of you for very interesting thoughtful and uh, uh, thoughtful presentation uh, which enriches us we are out of time the future is uh, uncertain but the end is always near thank manika ma'am thank uh, thakur sir thanks organizers thanks participants and with this i announce this webinar is over here thank you very much sir. once again ma'am we have not received the feedback of the form please send it in the chat box so that we can fill it the session yeah. was very informative thank you ma'am but we didn't got the feedback form it is a request to please send it on the chat ma'am feedback link please thank you ma'am thank you thank you Please upload the feedback in chat box and also with the.